of course it never fails it never fails as soon as i hit the record button my dog started barking <laughs> it's one second big fun I swear. <laughs> i'll edit that i'll edit that part out big fun <laughs> hey be nice he has a, he has a talent for that maybe that could be part of the science writing is it uh navigating your dog's works for why okay. not you know it makes it sensory it, <laughs> that's right <scary. laughs> okay all right well um welcome class um uh, uh, i'm excited today to have a conversation with suzanne strike you all have of course been reading her book um the middle of somewhere and i've gotten some great feedback from you guys that you're enjoying it as i enjoyed it and uh, suzanne and i um got to know each other uh several years ago when i was working at the william king museum of art in Abingdon, Virginia, just right up the road. And um, Suzanne actually has a, a studio there now. And she did a or one of her um, uh, shows, uh, um, Notes on the State of Virginia, I believe it was called. It had shown other museums around the state and country. And at the time was being shown uh, at, at William King Museum. And so we got to know each other. And I just I really enjoyed her work and was, um, her insightful observations about the nature of uh, um, uh, art in relation to nature, but also uh, how to talk about and write about these things. And so I thought her book was a really a nice complement and supplement to the subject matter in the course. And so just a brief introduction. Uh, so Suzanne, um, and Suzanne, correct me if I'm uh, wrong about any of this, is from the Chicago area originally, but has lived in Virginia for many years That's right. Yeah. Uh, and currently resides in Bristol, Virginia, um, not far from where I live. And so um, uh, she continues to do art and write and has um, uh, a lot of other things in print and also um, different uh, exhibits that have been on display in addition to the um, artwork that's the middle of somewhere is based on. So uh, Suzanne, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Well, thank you for inviting me. I, I enjoy this meeting, even though it's electronic, <laughs> it feels very real. Just like right. I hope the book does, you know, when you when you think of reading words on a page, you want them to be to feel like an actual experience for people. I do as a writer. True, and that that's kind of a conversation uh, that we've had in this class and other classes too. It's just the divide between sort of um, experiential communication in terms of uh, traditional, you know, face to face and print, and, and versus this sort of this new Zoom age. Um, yeah. But I really enjoyed. Uh, I think I've told you this before. Um, before I even read any of your work, I really enjoyed one of the artist talks that you gave at your exhibit at, at William King. And so I just kind of found your insights really engaging. And so that's, you know, thank you. Um, thank you so much. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've got several questions and, and class, as I mentioned okay. to you, all the questions that you submitted and some of the commentary that you've provided about Suzanne's book, we're going to use to drive the conversation. And so um, I'll just start, um, I guess, in the beginning, asking Suzanne, what it what it is that you do, and also kind of contextualize the difference between the different maybe subgenres of science writing or writing in the sciences um, um, that we kind of discussed offline here. Like you know, and it, for mm -hmm. context, you guys know we've discussed the difference between science writing and scientific writing. So, Suzanne, where do you think you fall within that sort of spectrum? Well, I I fall in the category of nature. I I consider it nature writing or science writing from a um, creative nonfiction um, point of view, not uh, as, as a working scientist. And I think that makes a lot of difference, though you can get um, very poetic scientists writing like David George Haskell, who's written a book about sound uh, recently and um, he's from the Chattanooga area, originally from England. Uh, he writes very poetically, but he's a scientist. And then you can get um, nature writers who write rather uh, scientifically or factually, uh, and so there isn't really a distinction other than their background, where they're coming from. Um, but if you're a science scientist, you certainly have uh, a, a certain kind of slant that will affect everything you write. Whereas what I do, I'm a visual artist, which makes me and I the subset of uh, nature writers. Um, and I think that's kind of unusual because when I was looking for um, Similar writers, I only found a few um, who who come at this kind of writing, creative nonfiction, from an artist's point of view, and have a background in um, natural history, more or less, um, and uh, incorporate that. I really believe in synthesis. Um, 
of all different sorts, of all different kinds of experience. If you notice in uh, the middle of somewhere, um, there is talk about art history and history and um, nature and science and um, all sorts of things that I consider the, the boundaries of those things to flow more than to be static and separate. And I think that when we're in school, uh, especially high school and beyond, um, those things become more and subjects become more and more separated. Whereas for me, they're fluid. And I think that that's one of my objects um, in this book is to create that fluidity, that seamlessness between my interests. Yeah. So would you describe, I mean, I think you've described yourself before as a mixed media artist. Would that be an accurate um, sort of? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I do a lot of different kinds of things. In back, you'll see a painting, just painting on wood and um, sketchbooks. And um, then the, the mixed media assemblages, which right. were um, the, the basis of the middle of somewhere. Uh, this is an unusual book in the sense that it was based on the art. The art didn't come second. Usually art illustrates text. This time the text illustrates the, um, the images, which um, are combined with topographical maps, um, paintings and drawings, found objects, and um, and they're rather challenging to do for me because there's so many options. And I think you'll find that in writing too. There are so many options and that's why editing and in the, in the case of making an art work, selecting what you're gonna put in is so important. That's an interesting, I hadn't thought about that, the dynamic between um the order that you uh, cr create, right? So yeah, you're right that most of the time when you're writing a book, there's illustrations that are done sort of as a, su a supplement or a complement yeah. to what you're writing, but you already yeah. had the collection of visuals and imagery, and then you were deciding based on that ex that experience, um, how to sort of narrate that based on memory. So that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, so what, um, what do you think is, yeah, your point, I think, is apt about like, you know, in school, we have sort of buckets like art is over here, science is over here, and we have sort yeah. of buckets within those. And yeah. I agree. I think it's sort of a false, um, false distinction in a lot of ways. And of course, there are unique yeah. characteristics to each one of those broader fields. But what do you think in terms of writing in the sciences or writing about the sciences? What do you think the, um, the, the value of that is? And it's kind of my question is sort of threefold. So the first one is maybe really hard because it's very broad. So for society or cultural in general, in general, we'll stick with the United States, in particular in the U.S. So what's the value of society for this type of work or this type of um, vocation? Um, the second would be like for the specific audiences that you're writing for. And then also the third part would be for you. Like, what's the value for you? So I guess it's sort of a threefold question. I'll take the, the first two relate to me. And that is when I write, it's for a general audience. It's for the it's for a non um it's, it's not for a scientist in a scientific journal, nor is it for an art magazine. I'm writing not for the art world or I'm, oh my gosh, my phone. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no. I'll just let it ring. Never thought of turning off my phone. Nobody ever <laughs> calls me on that one. Um, so uh, constant distractions are something you have to get used to when you're writing <laughs> or doing art. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, so I'm writing for a general audience because I want to bring uh, ideas that I think are important and I, I want to share them. I'm putting them out there for others to, to think about as well. One of the main um, goals of this book was to have, a, to have the tone or have the voice of a, of, of a friend, of somebody you're traveling with, not somebody who's um, telling you something, but somebody who's taking you along. Mm -hmm. And and for that reason, that the question you ask is, is uh, about who is what the audience and what is the purpose? The purpose is really to, in a way to show people how to travel, how, mm -hmm. how to experience the world through the way I do. It's not telling you this is the way you should do it, but it's telling you something about experiencing the world th through, um, deep reflection about one's own life, about, about the natural world and history and characters I meet and how to 
create a synthesis of all those things and how to experience those things deeply. I think in our world today, we experience things superficially a great deal. So it's important to me to go deeper. Now to go deeper and yet still have a chapter that ends, <laughs> that beginning, begins and ends in, in it creates a story is a challenge because there's so much you wanna put in there. So you have to, you, back to that idea of editing, you have to edit, you have to get things um, said and sometimes only suggested. Sometimes there's a, um, a phrase that is a suggestion of, a, of another thought that people can, readers can take farther, which I like. Now, the importance to me, I say that, say in the preface that it's, um, that writing takes a short thought and makes it into a long thought. I mean, let's say you, you walk out and you say, oh, that's a beautiful bird up there. And then you walk out and get in the mail, take the mail back and you're, 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 you don't even think about it. You, but if you're writing about it, you think, oh, well, what kind of bird was that? And why was I distracted? Why didn't I stop and look? And you think of all these different things. You think, well, let me incorporate those things. Distraction, focus, bird migrating, my traveling. You know, I'm just making that up. But every single um, time you write, you have to go deeper into a subject. You, you can't be satisfied with it on the surface, just like you would in conversation too. You might not, you, you, you would be seen as a really big nerd if you explained everything to yeah. your friends, you know? Um, but in writing, you can, you know, you can explain photosynthesis and say, photosynthesis, you know, that was kind of, it's kind of a dry word for this incredible thing that I'm thinking about. How about the green fuse? You know, I, as I do in that first chapter. Um, and and talk about a poem and then go into it in, in a in a more um interesting way than the, just passing it by so it 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 it's a thought process that i really like in terms of writing yeah it reminds me kind of of the and i think my students maybe i guess pun intended noticed that, that you had included the idea i guess the the feature of noticing things that's and as a good way of traveling is yeah. Uh, but as you point out, like noticing things is one thing and then being able to translate it, that into engaging content and prose uh, is another. And it's very iterative. I love your idea of taking a small or, a, you know, a yeah, small thought and sort of expanding it, but then also recognizing that at some point you have to stop. And I think there's this iterative like um, tension where you have to have enough. And most students, I think it takes a while to learn this because they're so used to having word counts and it's very like. Uh, clear how what what frame they sort of just write until they meet the word count not you all you are great students i was just telling suzanne i was bragging on you before this you all, <laughs> all strong writers but in general stu students have to learn um how to uh, tailor the the prose or the content or whatever it may be to the audience and that starts with something small but then at some point you have to craft it um to be short enough i mean the, the chapters in Somewhere, one reason it's very readable, in my opinion, is that they're relatively short. You know, they, you know, they, they kind of say a lot in a, a relatively brief amount of space. And um, one of my favorite quotes, I use it in all my writing classes, is from Pascal, Blaise Pas Pascal, Pascal, who was a scientist and philosopher. Yeah. I always forget what centuries. It was a while ago. But um, he said he wrote a letter to a friend and he started it and he said, I apologize that this letter is too long I didn't have time to make it shorter <laughs> that's exactly right yeah. yeah and how do I say something I just said in a whole paragraph into one sentence or one phrase that and that becomes a mental exercise a very good mental exercise because uh, it's sloppy to just keep repeating or keep rephrasing or keep trying to tr define it better and let letting your reader just wade through that and I I, I actually have little tolerance for books like that now. Yeah. I also, um, to make it more reader friendly and to make it more interesting for me is I create stories rather than, um, you know, um, exposition and, you know, telling, telling people. If I have facts to say, I often have one of the characters in the story, a guide or um, a person I meet tell them. And that was a, a, a something I discovered uh, after starting to write this book, I thought, how do I avoid story stoppers, which means, okay, 
I'm writing about my experience at Natural Bridge, but now I'm going to tell you all these facts about how high it is and why it was formed. That's just a total story stopper. Make the guide say it. You know, the guide and I are talking about a snake she sees down in the rocks, and then she goes into her script, I say. Well, that is a way that I can create that flow of uh, a story rather than, uh, you know, creating this boring, okay, now I'm going to tell you all these facts, like a tour book, and it's not a tour book. In fact, the only uh, people I think are disappointed in the book who think it's, oh, I'm going to buy this book and I'm going to travel around Virginia and see all these places. No, it's it's not that, and it's not going to tell you. What it tells you is the difference between being a tourist and a traveler, I think. Being a mm -hmm. traveler means that you 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 take in facts, but you you take them in. You don't just um, hear them and move on. You take them in and you combine that with your experience of life. When I say I'm uh, sidetracked by design or um, or uh, daydreaming, a focused daydream, I don't mean that I'm going off into realms of what the list on my kitchen, my refrigerator is on the grocery list. I'm talking about um, like the one in, about poplar forest when I, I'm looking at a case of objects and I think of my grandmother's photograph and all the objects my mother has around that photograph in another glass case. So I'm merging the personal with the present, the personal past with the present, which makes the present, makes those objects in Thomas Jefferson's case, uh, the museum's case, much more interesting and visceral. These these are objects people handled, you know, and so, it, and they use it, they're real things. They're not just put there for, you know, um, to prettify something. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I, it made me think, it put me in the mind of sort of um, the, the multi-sensory right as you mentioned like being able being a traveler not not a mere tourist entails being there and and not just there but engaging your environment in a way beyond just sort of facts and objective data and you know sort of the rick steves version of europe where you're <laughs> this is this building was built on this date and then we move on to the next one and this is built on this date yeah, yeah being able to notice things and be a purposeful wanderer and, a, and a, an intentional traveler and i think um the types of work that you do, whether it's the middle of somewhere or your assemblages or other, you know, other pieces in your exhibits. Um, uh, the thing to me that makes it um, interesting, one thing that makes it interesting is not just the content, but the way in which it's presented, you know, for, and so for this book in particular, of course, it's the written prose, uh, but it's also, which is very descriptive. And, and of course, um, even if it's not actually engaging your sense of hearing, you're, you're describing in very vivid detail, um, you know, what a bird's call sounds like, the the streams in the background. So you're using a written prose to sort of engage the senses, but also it's visual because you have your, your illustrations and your paintings um, inserted on, on various pages and stuff. The design of the book is very good. Um, so to, to give a little bit of context, Suzanne, the final assignment, which our students are about to move into, is um, playing on this idea that when you're communicating about science and writing about science, using multiple modes of communication, whether it be a um, particular type of technology or a different genre. So mixing media, more or less, can help you to communicate things in a much more interesting and effective and engaging way than just mere, that's not to say that there can be, of course, like very interesting, engaging mere prose or, or mere books. There can there be, yeah. Is. There that's definitely a, is, but I mean, yeah. there, there is that kind of unique thing, and especially given, you know, in here we're going to get into like using the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite so they can do a video where they're incorporating um, a narrative poem that they've written or something oh, about yeah. the sciences. So using different forms of communication to communicate based on their specific purpose and their audience. So the rhetorical context, like what are they trying to achieve? Is this just a creative right. piece yeah. or are they actually trying to persuade somebody to, to change their attitude or their behavior? So I'm leaving it up to them being very flexible in terms of their content, what their purpose is, but the idea is for them to mix media. And so I guess my question for you is like, when you're going into writing this book or doing any of your work, how do you intentionally think about those things? Like these types of media afford their own unique um, traits and and um, uh, and how do you leverage those, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, it's, in, it's, in, it's an interesting question. One of the things that um, I did in my chapters 
was I, I embed occasionally say where the core idea is. And, and you wouldn't necessarily get this, but I'm telling you all now, this is the secret. In every chapter, there's the core idea of the assemblage, why the assemblage looks the way it does. For instance, at the, it's at, at the end of flyway. It says something like, I'm standing, the flyway has a, a vortex of feathers with an egg at the bottom. And the egg looks like the, the north and south hemispheres the, or of, a, of a globe. Um, so in the writing, I'm embedding reasons. I'm not saying this is why I did, did it that way. I'm embedding that. So I'm standing it in the in a vortex of ducks going around me thinking about migration and about um, being the center and being still in the center of movement. Okay, so one of the things when you're working with imagery and um, text or, 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 or the written or the spoken word is to try is to make sure you relate it in some way. It doesn't have to be now I'm going to tell you why I'm doing it. It can, re, trust your readers, and that's something I had to learn. I had to say, okay, this I want to make clear. I'm going to say what I mean, but this I'm going to trust my readers to get it. And even if they don't articulate it, even if they don't define that they get it, <laughs> they know it. That it it it's suggested, and they feel it. So do that. Um, suggest why you're, you don't make them uh, not relate in ways, unless you want some kind of surprise and surprise is sometimes necessary as well. Uh, the surprise has to be more mysterious than what I call mystification. I'm, I'm always interested in the mysterious, in nature, in human nature, but I don't like mystification, which to me means you really intend something like in painting and then you kind of scribble it out so it doesn't look like you do, or you make a poem it says something and then you say, oh, that's too clear. And you, you try to get that out of there. And so nobody really knows what you're saying. Um, I, I mean, that works for some people. It doesn't work for, for my purposes. Um, and, you know, I, I had this, uh, this one passage. Um, it, you talked a lot about the sensory experience. Uh, this one passage that if you asked me to read something, I was going to read. But, sure, um, go for it. Yeah, it's great. Um, so um, I'm going to, instead of just reading it to you, I'm going to comment on it as I read. Okay. And this is from the Green Fuse, and I'm standing on the porch. Week over, I stood alone on the farmhouse porch, watching the mid-May sunrise. On that unseasonably chilly morning, I clasped a hot mug of tea with both hands, touching its heat to my cold cheek. That's not accidental. That's not an accidental detail. I could have said something about the floorboards or the railing or, no, I wanted the heat against my cheek. Every, everyone can feel that. So I've got the sense of touch. Then I go on to say the black Angus nibbled shoots of fresh grass. And I thought right now in each blade of grass, some tiny green disc snatches a ray of sun, a spot of water, a molecule of CO2 and the air, and friend, from the air and presto, I use dashes, presto. And when you're writing, you have to know the opportunities you have with punctuation um, and not overdo it, <laughs> do it when it's necessary. And presto, the plant makes its own food. In the process, the leaf tosses out useless oxygen, ironically providing life-giving breath to animals. <clears throat> Photosynthesis sounded too studied for such magic. So there, now I'm going, I've just explained a scientific process. In my own words, it snatches a ray of sun. So you don't read a biology textbook and say it snatches a ray. So you get it personal, but then photosynthesis sounded too studied for such magic. So I searched for something better when a line from a Dylan Thomas poem sprang to mind. Synthesis, literary, science, I'm at a farm. You know, all these things are converging. Um, there's no thing like, oh, you know, by the way, a poem can, I'm not going to tell people that a poem can reveal certain 
truths about the natural world just the way science can. I'm tell I'm showing you that it can, or I'm showing you how I personally am using it to do so. Still leaning on the porch rail, I whispered, leaning on the porch rail, my physical body leaning on the porch rail. Again, that's not accidental that I said that. It's not just because I was leaning on the porch rail, okay? I could have said many things or I could have not included them. And I probably included a, a paragraph about what, how I was standing on that porch and, and um, winnowed it down to leaning on the porch rail. Um, so I whispered, now, I'm, now it's in italics, the force that, and I, I don't use ellipses much, but I'm using them here to indicate that I'm searching in my brain for the, for the lines of the poem. The force that through the green fuse um, drives the flower, drives my green age. Um, now, now I go back to description of myself. I inhaled, conscious of breathing, of living equation. Sun plus water plus carbon dioxide equals sugar and oxygen, breath and life, the green fuse. So um, in that, in those two paragraphs, I've just incorporated um, visceral feeling, science, literature, and personal reflection. I, I wasn't satisfied with, oh, that's photosynthesis amazing and then right. done something else okay then sound whack that's not unintentional the screen door slapped behind me now i will say that this did happen to me i mean it's <laughs> not but but whack you know italics um exclamation mark and dash so it really stands out in other words it's whacking me out of that thought too um, but it's also a sound. The screen door slapped behind me. I turned to see John Sprawl, Elizabeth's brother. It's a habit of his to swing by for some morning coffee and fresh baked bread, suggestion of taste and smell. And then you get into him and his character, a, a farmer having this big hand holding a little teacup. So um, I'll tell you my process. It might help your students. Um, I sat in this very room with a legal size um, pad, a yellow pad, and for an hour every morning wrote every single thing I could think of about, uh, of these experiences, making these assemblages. The place, how I got to the place, I would just brainstorm. I did not start on the computer because you know what happens when you start in the computer? You start thinking, oh, that word's not right. Oh, <laughs> I could have said that better because you yeah. see it there, you know? I can relate. Yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you lose your the flow. You lose that connection to the experience, the connection to your deeper thought, and you start getting into the mechanics. And I can't do it. Maybe other people can do it. So I just free free freehand wrote wrote and wrote and wrote for for like forty five minutes to an hour straight without going back, making sure if it was sloppy, not correcting, sometimes crossing something out, and then making it get to a different point or something, but and then I, I did that for like two months mm. for every single um, assemblage and the introduction and maybe an epilogue. I had an epilogue. I don't have it now. But I, I didn't know how it would shape up. But so I, I just wanted to let that flow. And um, then I went back and typed it into the computer. And it was much, not, I wouldn't say easier. Then comes the other job of editing and saying, these chapters are too much alike. You know, and um, I'm driving to a place. I'm getting out of the car. I'm, you know, like boring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to be hard on yourself in some ways, in the right way, True. and in the in the, in another way, not hard on yourself in the sense of let it go. Don't worry about um, about how other people write or um, have told you how to write except for you, Chase. <laughs> right. But, you know, I had to get out of bad habits from high school. And it's mm -hmm. like, how many decades later? Like, uh, yeah, you can write fragments. Yeah, you can. I don't have to have a topic sentence. You know, I, there are things like topic sentences, but 
not you know so i you have to get uh, you have to wiggle out of some the old um straight jackets you've learned about essay writing for composition mm -hmm. for for school these right. are different you know the creative nonfiction um has to find a very natural voice and the other thing um is to read it out loud mm -hmm. uh and you'll you'll stumble over phrases or words and you'll think why did I do that? When in writing, it didn't seem awkward, but now when I read it, it says it seems awkward. So, um, so read things out loud. That's a great, yeah, I've heard, I've actually gone by that rule myself for some time now and I've it really helped my own writing. Uh, I forget where I heard that some other writer mentioned that like definitely, I don't know why I never, I guess when you, they don't teach that when you're in school, but it definitely helps because if you, I don't know, for whatever reason, we just try to feel, uh, we try to, um, sound more sometimes more intellectual or more astute when we're writing things on paper and then when we read it out loud we're like that sounds ridiculous <laughs> so yeah trying doesn't, to like yeah it doesn't yeah. sound like me yeah it does yeah. doesn't sound like your, your like your own uh, voice first of all which is important and then also just the mechanic mechanics can get really really messy um, I love your explanation of um, your process there and, and as in particular the subtext like all the thinking and the, the note taking that you did that results, as you said, in this one passage, and there's all this that goes in behind the scenes and in your own thought process. So that it's just evidence, you know, that the work is not all. It, it's evident in the sense that it come the final product comes across to the reader or to the viewer or to the listener or whatever, um, and they should get it. But it shouldn't be so on the nose like that subtext. You're not going to include that, you know, um, you know, in the actual the text itself, and so. Um, you know, I guess when my students are doing the assignments, whether it's say maybe they're doing a podcast episode about some particular subject, there's there's no reason, of course, at the beginning to say, you know, I chose to do a podcast about this subject because X, Y, and Z and list a bunch of reasons why audio presentations would be the would be the best. But embedded within the work, just like in the middle of somewhere, you're they would be making intentional choices that exemplify or um uh sort of lean into the particular and unique affordances of audio that they can do, whether it's uh, using like voice actors or uh, emphasizing sound effects and how that that kind of puts the person in a particular yes. situation. Yes. Um, uh, and so, yeah, like every medium has its own affordances that you can you can utilize. Um, so I love that. Yeah, like everything. I mean, it's not just with multimedia, it's with just written texts. Yeah, I mean, there's always subtext that's kind of not too on the nose or expressly stated that has to be there. Otherwise, it's not going to be a effective or interesting or engaging um, text. So yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, let's see. So let, me, let me kind of look at some of the student and and um, students. I sent uh, Suzanne some of your all's questions and also they were they were absolutely fantastic. And I could probably spend a few hours answering. Yeah. I mean, I really I was thinking about the one who said he was interested or she was interested in astronomy mm. or astrophysics or um, I'd have to look. Let's say astronomy and um, it, it really was interesting to me because I thought that person already has a personal way of approaching a subject. Interested in this, you know, the, the and it's it, it's uh, interesting that my last essay, which is coming out in an online magazine soon, it's called Sky Sketches, and it's about um, drawing from drawing with a pencil and a sketchbook, sitting out in my front yard eclipses and um, mm. astronomical um, events and that after and thinking about that after seeing the Webb space telescope pictures and all their fantastic right. detail and their and thinking why is my method still valid and, and then going going to my son who works um, he's actually a teacher at Rome State but he he um of religion and philosophy and English but he works for NASA too refining images of space and was always interested in space and, and really astronomy i mean like real astronomy not what i do like 10 45 i see the eclipse you know but i i come but my conclusion after i go through all the doubts is it's absolutely valid because my low tech way of experiencing the world because it's mine it's 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 my involvement. It's not just received information. It's my absolute deep connection to the event. 
Mm. And um, even the ant that bites my ankle, you know, so, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, it, that's part of what you have to kind of, well, that, that goes along with our short thought uh, becoming a long thought and with the visceral and with the way you enter a subject, how your take on it, that, that can take a few months to a few decades to figure out your personal way of sharing your experience of life and how that sharing can enhance other people's experience. Yeah, the the dis, the uh, distinction in the relationship of subjectivity and objectivity is something yeah. that personally fascinates me. And I also, yes. um, because it personally fascinates me, I think it's so relevant to this class as I, I had students uh, designed an assignment, sorry, getting distracted here. My dog's trying to bite my feet. <laughs> Uh, um, I may not edit this stuff out. I may just leave it because it's boring. Uh, I know, because that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I designed this assignment where I had students kind of intent, um, research different um, examples of uh, science communication and science writing online and um, discern uh, how subjective data and objective data were integrated or maybe one was emphasized and the other was kind of um, uh, not as prevalent. And I think, you know, that type of, I mean, without going, I would probably like to love, well, I mean, I know you and I could talk about it a lot too, but if your son teaches like um, religion and philosophy, it's like the idea of um, on a purely like, um, I use a very pretentious word here, ontological level, the idea yeah, like no, really, how, Einstein, yeah. how Einstein discovered, you know, like even um, our objective interpretations of the world with um, general theory of relativity, like nothing is actually truly objective from the no. human perspective, because everything, yeah. you know, at the quantum level, they've even discovered that when we observe a phenomenon, it it actually alters the objective thing that we're looking at. And so if you get all the way down to the nitty gritty, it's very mysterious. So you like mystery. So it's very mysterious, yeah. the relationship between what is actually objective in the, in the traditional sense of the word and then what is subjective in terms of how we experience the world. But I mean, to be able to communicate and to I guess, discern and agree on anything. We have to kind of agree on some objective well, facts and that type of thing. But at the same time, it is interesting yes. to see like, you know, like my experience, if I was to accompany you on your trips to go to the middle of somewhere, and even if we all, if we had the same uh, in, intention and being an intentional traveler and uh, a good traveler and noticing things, our experiences would be totally different. So on a yeah. purely a scientific, but then also philosophical level, like that's a really interesting thing to me. Yeah, well, uh, I think that in good art and good writing, there has to be some kind of conflict. And that is, to me, is my conflict. Um, and conflict doesn't mean, you know, problem. It means two different things colliding that don't necessarily go together. And mine is an extreme precision uh, with wanting to know the names of creatures, how they work, what kind of insects, what kind of blood insects have, what kind of um, uh, life cycle something has, uh, you know, reading science text and being very subjective. So that's my kind of conflict. That's that's the merger of, of a sort of opposing ideas. I mean, I don't think they're really opposing, but as you say, um, uh, they, they are in different realms oftentimes and people do separate them. So, so that's my challenge. And I think that energizes me. And so if it energizes me, it's gonna energize the art or the writing. It's clash, these things clash, you know? Um, so, uh, and I wanted to comment on your word ontological. Um, so let's just say in, in writing, you wanted to, in, in a writing like my book, Creative Nonfiction for a General Audience, um, you wouldn't have to describe it if you were writing to philosophers and you would be seen as like, why is he telling us that, you know, by them, but in a general, you don't have to pretend like they won't know it, even whether they will or won't, but you can embed a definition. Like, um, I could say, um, something like, um, uh, an entomologist that, that, that person who studies insects, comma, does, you know, saw this. So I embed a definition rather than saying, oh, they won't know what an entomologist is or, and, and not using the word that I really want to use. So I embed 
almost just like I'm talking to somebody, you know, that the kind of people who study insect. Um, so, uh, or that study of science or that branch of science or whatever. But, uh, you know, and this I learned from reading. When you start to write, you read more closely. And, you know, whether you're an amateur or a professional writer, you notice what other people do. And I, I'd say, wow, look at how that writer, I can remember it was um, David Hopes, um, a nature writer, playwright, poet from Asheville. And he did that. He'd use all sorts of words that I would avoid in writing, but he would embed the definition. I really love that. And in terms of getting into spiritual things, it's, uh, it can also all of a sudden sound lofty and pretentious. So at the very end of, of, of the Green Fuse, um, I try to get into that. And um, uh, I talk about, oh gosh, the, the rain falling and looking through the um, slats of the old barn like a cathedral window. Mm. And, and I'm thinking about this, the little bones in front of me, that's sort of like a relic. Now, I'm not Catholic, so, but I studied art history and I studied I, relics, cathedral. So I'm saying that I'm having a spiritual experience without saying, now I'm having a spiritual experience, everybody. You know, you, you, you imply it by what you're doing. Always the example, always the vivid detail, the experience rather than saying coming out of the text and saying okay reader you might not get this because the you know that's talking down to your reader and they don't like it they don't even might not even know why they don't like your book they just don't like it they said i got that um you know and and in a way you're also bringing them with you you're making them see something smell hay or hear the bird chittering or whatever so um there's nothing you can't write about if you if and if you think creatively how can I do this um, and reach my audience and make them and share it with them? Think of that word share rather than write down to them or something or, you know, tell them, you know, that, that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think even creative nonfiction, um, I know that I, when I first started doing more like, like technical writing or writing in the professions, if, you know, um, I kind of, you kind of, feel like you want to foreground some of the more formal types of writing that you learn in school. But what I learned yeah. in writing, grant writing in particular, and there are other genres, I think this is relevant to also, but um, being able, you might have to have some exposition, of course, with grant writing. Oh, There's a whole, whole bunch of, yeah. you know, you got to explain your budget and you got to have timelines and yeah. all that stuff, which I think having an extreme attention to detail, as you mentioned, and also um, being precise and all that is yeah. helpful. Um, but also too, like being able to leverage the type of writing that you do, um, which is creative. I mean, I found very quickly that the successful grant applications that we wrote um, most often began with or somehow integrated some type of narrative or something that didn't directly contribute to like, this is the, what the programming is going to look like, but it just helped the oh, reader. Yeah. Most of yeah. the time who was somebody sitting in an office on a committee, probably reading a hundred grant applications that were all dry and boring. You know, there's no <laughs> rule that says you have to like, you can't include some brief narrative or something. So being yeah. able to do these types of skills that people often associate with like a book like Middle of Somewhere or something they read online on a creative fiction website or something and integrating at least tidbits or snippets into more technical writing or professional writing, um, I think is really helpful. Um, yeah, and you yeah. mentioned um, introductions, it's beginning. Um, uh, what what I might do, I've never done a podcast, but but I, but anybody who's doing them probably has seen a, quite, a great deal of them or listened to a great deal of them. And just say which ones worked in terms of the introduction, in terms of segueing right into the, the main part of it. Um, uh, when I was writing in the middle of somewhere, I really thought a lot about how I began and ended every chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, I, in, in daily observations, the first line is two beauties Dan called from the porch. Now that's very intentional. I could have said my husband and I collect leaves and I paint on them sometimes, but no, it, that's called a medias res. It's putting you right in the center of the action right away. You know who I learned that from? Tolstoy. Um, he, he, starts, he starts a book and the family's scurrying around. And I thought, 
wow, he didn't say anything about who this family was. He starts you right in the center of the activity. You can learn from anybody and you can learn from your fellow students. Uh, and then you end, how do you end it? Well, you now, now you can end it with something different. I think about endings a lot. And at the end of that chapter, I write, um, we witness leaves lose all trace of green, chestnut brown dulling into umber. And we watch the painted images change like tattoos on aging skin as their leaf canvases fade. I don't say that this is a chapter about aging and about aging relationships, but that's really what I'm saying with those last lines. This yeah. is, this is um, a chapter about accepting age and accepting aging people around you. And, and so it's implied. So that, now I wouldn't begin a chapter like that necessarily, maybe. I'd re 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 but that's a way of ending it. So when you're doing a podcast too, you think of how to get people into it. Um, maybe you can put some, uh, just a, a, some identifiable thing, you know, where it's from, ETSU or whatever, you know, right away. But how do you get people right into your world and then how do you end it so that it doesn't just kind of straggle off and but how and you don't have to end it with a punch though you could but with <laughs> something that 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 um creates a kind of closure and you, it doesn't have to to say it. it can be it can suggest the mysterious or suggest the unknown but it has to do that it has to suggest something to leave with the listener so that's a that's a real challenge with podcasts. I think so. I think even with any kind of communication, and um, one of the students even mentioned, which you probably saw, like you have to have your audience care in some way. And I love your use of the word. Um, I don't think I've ever, I probably have heard other people use it, but I, I see it all the time in one of my sub disciplines, which is media ecology. It's the the Latin phrase in media res that you use. Like it basically means in the middle. Yeah, I think that's a good sort of analogy for um, how we experience texts whether they're books or or whatever we're all distracted and we all have things going on and so yeah to open and to grab people's attention you know we do have to have something like you were talking about with dan how you you know um uh and then when you close just to have something really to sort of set because we all just have so many things going on multi-century experiences my dog's barking he just ran in there fed, fed x man and so yeah um so if i'm gonna engage with a text or something yeah that needs to the person needs to care about it and be and be drawn in and you can use different um media specific I guess affordances to do that you also mentioned um one thing I try to talk a lot about in here is um rhetorical devices mm -hmm. uh, rhetorical appeals um but you you were using rhetorical device like metaphor and analogy is a very effective sometimes like the idea of um tattoos and and, and having that resonance with something in the natural world and I mean to me that kind of uh drawing to um, the four kind of like analogous connections just kind of puts people on the mind of like, how does this specific subject matter relate to something going on in my own life? So I I love metaphor and analogy a lot. I mean, I think, especially in science writing, some of my favorite science writing, um, just on a personal level is like theoretical physics and things. And it's impossible to understand, uh, some of those concepts without metaphor. And I, I, I'm, I'm already, this has been a great conversation. So I'm, already um, wary of our time, but I just want to give one brief aside. Oh, I think yeah. I mentioned this to you before, but I'm oh, not yeah, sure really, to my students. It um, this, goes fast when you're having fun. <laughs> it does. Um, one of my professors when I was in my doctoral program, his name is Ken Bach. He wrote, this is actually a dissertation, but it was published later. It's really academic. Um, so uh, I kind of wish he would adapt it, but it's called Metaphor and Knowledge, uh, The Challenges of Writing Science. And he's a musician. Uh, um, as well as an academic. And so his idea, he kind of used this metaphor of harmonics um, to describe the challenges of writing sciences. So he kind of used a framework of like having resonance. Um, and, and it was a case study of the Santa, have you heard of the Santa Fe Institute? It's in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, their thing is com complexity, like complex complexity as it manifests in different types of sciences, whether it's um, uh, quantum mechanics or astrophysics uh, physics or whatever. So how, how complexity works and what it is. And his hypothesis going in was that um, these scientists really know what they're talking about. They have the math kind of mastered and they they have these really difficult and complex uh, subjects to talk about that us mere humans can in no way comprehend unless they dumb it down for us by using metaphor. 
He's like, well, that's somewhat true, not in a derogatory sense, but that there's some truth to that. But what he found that was more surprising was that the, the, the scientists themselves could not even begin to conceptualize these things because they were so mysterious and backward and so different than what we experience in the everyday. They were so different that they couldn't even conceptualize of the ideas or make any new discoveries or, or um, without first conceiving of the things in metaphorical terms. So they had to first begin with wow. metaphor to even start to think wow. about the quantum yeah. concepts. To start there. They it's... had to start there, yeah. And and he found that a lot of the creativity and a lot of the breakthroughs and innovations, starting with Einstein, but going back before that, or not starting with Einstein, of course, was one of the big ones that they talk about because um, a lot of his discoveries were relevant. But um, most scientists, you know, their discoveries and breakthroughs don't start with the math. They don't start with experimentation. They start with some intuitive breakthrough that's, grounded in metaphor or some analogous way of thinking about the natural world and their sensory. Yeah. Experience. So then when they turn around to write about it, sometimes it's not even, there's not a whole lot of like translating to the lay audience. They already have in mind these metaphors because that's where they began. <laughs> that's where yeah. They I was reading about string theory and it was right. like, what? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's hardly provable really scientifically, but it's all, it's all this metaphor and, and the dimensions and everything. Uh, it baffles me, but I could, if I were writing about it, I would say that it baffles me, but it takes me out of this mind zone that I live in. And, you know, part of writing um, is wanting to live in a, in a zone that you want to be in more, you know, you, and uh, my, my kinds of writing in art, um, if you're a scientist, you write about your, you, I guess you write about your 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 expertise of your subject matter but um but uh that's fascinating and and that book is for writers is it um so it's, it is yeah. yeah so he you know i was in a tech the name of the program was technical and professional writing we had a lot of yeah. people so it's going to be written in a different tone it is i mean it's, it is very i mean it's definitely not um it's like you said he adapted it from his dissertation and you know dissertations are <laughs> They, there's yeah. a joke about dissertations yeah. you know there's three my chair said there's three people that read uh your dissertation your chair <laughs> your mom and your dad <laughs> and i it's doubt a, that i doubt that even that's that's probably stretching yeah it. even you know. that <laughs> so, um, but in terms of dissertations like he adapted it quite a bit and it is interesting i wouldn't recommend it to undergrads just because it's it's very kind of dense and stuff but um it is yeah. there's some fascinating insights but i see it playing out in your writing and others uh, um that are writing in the sciences about just being able to communicate some complex ideas, whether you're describing in vivid imagery or using analogy um, and metaphor. It's just, it kind of helps to enliven your, your writing and your content and to engage audiences. But um, I mean, yeah. all this is, is fantastic. I mean, we've, we've gone past, that's totally fine. Totally fine. We've gone over. I don't care. They can, <laughs> I'm sure they're still listening. Um, so I guess maybe we'll close with a couple questions that were directly from the students. They're kind of more kind of one-off just they were interested and I was interested in this as well so what I think this one's two parts so what um what comes more naturally to you to you personally like the uh illustrations and painting or like the visual art or writing yeah uh, art art comes art more comes naturally, naturally. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll, have to I'll tell you when I started college I couldn't even get through composition they sent me to the writing lab this mm -hmm. this person has so many writing problems and I say that because it should be encouraging to those people who think I have ideas, but I can't quite get it down. And I don't know grammar and I don't know this and I don't know, you know, uh, I think perseverance is, is, the, is the key, the, the will, not the talent to say something will get you farther than sheer talent. Sheer talent without anything to say just, just is there. Um, but I always had something I wanted to say about the natural world and how it affected me and, and how I saw this human society and how I experienced art. I mean, I always had so much to say. I kept journals and I noticed in my journals, I'm getting better and better and better at the mechanics of writing. And, and then, um, you know, I, I started to, to write art reviews in the nineties. And, and so, uh, then I'd see how what editors did and how they clean it up. And I, I studied that. What am I doing? Oh, I'm writing comma splices all the time. I'm writing dangling modifiers all the time. I, you know, so I had to study writing. Uh, maybe I always had a voice. May, I always had things to say. So writing took, took much longer. Art came more naturally. 
yeah, it's always cringe, cringy sometimes to look back at your old. I do the same thing when I look back at my old stuff, but it's okay. You just got to be compassionate with yourself. And uh, we always, I think we're always getting better and learning. You mentioned yeah. pers- persistence. Yeah. Maybe this is science writing. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite Charles Spurgeon, uh, he has a quote, and I used to have it posted somewhere in my office. I don't know where it is now, but it's by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. <laughs> I've, always, I've always liked that. Uh, um, but okay. So, uh, the last question, I guess, is fairly generic, but I think it would be helpful. And you've already covered a lot of this. Um, but if you just had any maybe sort of um, advice for folks who kind of want to uh, do this um, as their vocation, whether it's professionally or or something and on a volunteer, but just in any case, any vocational sense to write about the sciences, what would be, and obviously they're taking steps, they're in school, they're in this class for one thing, but what might be something unique that you could tell them that would help them in that journey as they try to kind of craft their their skill or um something they could read or do or places they could go or just a mindset. I mean, you've given a lot already on that, but if there's anything else that you could think of. Well, first, I suppose um, it depends on where they're coming from. Are they astronomers or biologists and they're writing from that place? That's, or are they um, in the arts? One, one, one person was from, uh, was a musician, played the clarinet. Immediately, I, 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 I thought, oh, tell, that person about David Rothenberg, who writes mm. about um, why birds sing, who wrote a book called Why Birds Sing, and he plays his clarinet with birds, and he and he um, he's a philosopher, so he conjectures why why they sing, and whether they're responding to his music or not, and um, so find where you're coming from and keep honing that down, like, and then try to writing is a way of understanding who you are. What is your voice? Um, uh, you know, we have we have one, but we have to find it because it's diluted with experience, with others writing, with what teachers have told you. Some teacher, every teacher has something of value, and you have to learn what to take of that when you're applying it to your own writing. Keep a journal, keep writing, um, and and write to an intelligent friend or a relative. I mean, I have a sister-in-law I pretend that I'm writing to because I know that she, that she is going to, she's not interested in the same subjects, but she has a certain kind of way of reading that I know I will be most myself writing her. So mm-hmm. um, that's, keep a journal and then try to develop an, a, a, a journal article or um a podcast or something that you do that is a project that you sustain, you start and you work on it to the end and you shape it. Because a journal can be just random thoughts and random thoughts are great. And they're they're great for getting you loosened up as a writer and for delving deeper. Um, But they don't necessarily, they they aren't meant to share with someone. So think then in terms of, okay, these journal notes are all on, um, how driving is different from walking. So, um, and what I see when I'm driving, what I see compared to what I'm walking. So put those together and make uh, make a an essay about that or a podcast or something like that so that you have to shape it and you have to narrow it down and you get that, you, you have to have personal goals. I think one of the most difficult things I've seen in art students is when they graduate, they, they don't have anybody telling them what to do anymore. They don't have projects and grades and deadlines and you have to learn how to make your own. Yeah, that's a hard thing trying to keep your own. Yeah, that's <laughs> on a, <laughs> a very practical level. That is a, a skill that takes time to master yeah. for sure. Um, Suzanne, thank you very much. This has been, well, thank awesome. you. I've had a great time and I'm sure my students will get a lot from this and uh, it's just made my day to be able to talk to you and um, I'm sure we'll uh, see each other again in the future. But um, thank you and uh, students, if you, um, have other questions for Suzanne, I'm sure she'd be happy to fill them. You can send them to me and I can forward them on, but she, I think you can probably to. visit her website, which is, remind me, Suzanne, Suz, is it my, Suzanne? My Strike. website? Yeah, your website? SuzanneStrike.com. Okay. And, and, and if any of you are up this way, my studio is now open to the public. Uh, on certain days, we haven't figured out how to post those dates and by appointment. So just write me and I'll be there because, um, you know, I don't want you to come all the way up and for some reason, I'm not there that day. Um, so yeah, come up and we can talk about writing and you can take a look at my new project. 
Awesome. Thank you again, Suzanne. I Thank appreciate you. it. All right. I'm going to stop recording. We can talk for a second, but thank you. All right. See.